Today on Unity Motorsports Garage, we're going to dive into the Boss 429, the most misunderstood Ford engine of all time. So stay tuned, but in order to do this, we got to go back to 1964 for some NASCAR history. Mopar had been competing with the 426 Wedge to no avail against the Ford 427, so Chrysler set out to put Hemi-style cylinder heads on the raised block 426 to create the 426 Hemi, and that got things going at a fast rate. Behind the pace car, Goldsmith at number 26 Plymouth and Petty number 43 Plymouth, first row. Junior Johnson, number three Dodge and Pardue, number 54 Plymouth, second row. The white flag. One more lap to go, and Richard Petty is still moving along easy and strong. Richard has one lap lead over second, two laps over third and fourth. The crowd cheers as Richard Petty and his number 43 Plymouth takes the checkered flag going away. Richard Petty rolls into the winner's circle as his father did five years ago. The jubilant Petty crew runs to greet him. This is their victory too. They who have worked so long and so hard for the big one. This has been a great show for Plymouth, who ran one, two, three. Hardu was second and Goldsmith third. Four didn't take this lightly. They knew that if you won on Sunday, you sold cars on Monday. So that led to the development of the 90 Day Wonder, the 427 SOHC. Great engine developed a ton of horsepower. But Bill France of NASCAR realized what was coming down the pipe, and he decided to ban these new exotic engines for 1965, which left the Hemi and the 427 SOHC without a place to race. 1965 racing season was pretty much a runaway season for Ford and Mercury. As Chrysler was out of the picture, they focused their efforts on drag racing. So therefore, Ford went back to the 427 FE engine and did really well with it. In fact, they stayed with that power plant all the way up until 1969 in different configurations. But it set things in motion for what was to come. By the late 1960s, it was apparent Ford was going to need a new engine to remain competitive against the Hemi in the Aero Wars of NASCAR. Bunky Knudsen had just came over in 1968 from GM and gave the mandate to build an engine that could go dominate NASCAR, which led to the Boss 429. But in order to be legal for competition, they had to install that engine into 500 cars, which led to the Boss 429 Mustang. The problem was, they didn't get it installed into the cars soon enough, so they went halfway through the 1969 season running the 427 Tunnel Port. When you want to be the best, you go get the best, and that's exactly what Ford did in 1969. They went and lured Richard Petty away from the Chrysler camp, and for the first time, Petty Blue was now Ford Blue. This led to an all-star cast in 1969. You had Richard Petty, Kel Yarborough, David Pearson, Donnie Allison, and Leroy Yarborough. This led to total dominance in 1969. One of the small details that gets left out about the Boss 429 is the fact that Ford contracted Holly carburetors to develop a specialty carburetor just for that engine. Hence, the Dominator was born. And in fact, it powered them to their first win in Atlanta with Kel Yarborough, which you're about to see. Kel, you're here at Atlanta with a new Mercury, the first time it's raced this year and with a new engine, and I'm sure some problems have cropped up. Well, uh, they have buzz, Chris. Uh, this new Mercury Spoiler 2 is, uh, looks like it's going to be a real fine race car, and of course we have the new 429 uh, Boss engine, which uh, it looks like it's going to do a real good job for us, but uh, having a uh, the car at Daytona, which was a total loss. We had to build a new car. We were about three days late uh, getting to the racetrack, but uh, we sure uh, looks like that uh, the Wood Brothers are, are catching us up quick. So the car today is running real well, and uh, we're tickled to death with it. Around the final turn and down the home stretch, the checkered flag is up for Cale Yarborough. Everybody standing, and 
time he receives the checker, and here comes David Pearson around. And he gets the checker, and also he finishes. Hello again, Kale. Last year, this year makes it three straight. What kind of a race was it? This it was a hard race. Uh, well, for me, it seemed like the longest race I've ever run. I'd get out in the lead, and even one time we had two left. But uh, and I just tried to play it cool, but the, everything went good. The fit crew, the Wood Brothers, did a fantastic job. And this new Mercury Cyclone with the Hemi engine did a great job, and everything concerned. You would think with all of the success that came from the NASCAR Super Speedways that that would transfer over to the street. Well, it didn't happen that way. The Boss 429 Mustangs could barely get into the 13 second range in the quarter mile. And there's a lot that causes this, but it also leads to another issue. Many other professional drag racers tried to use this engine and they didn't have much luck either. And so that's where the story is going to go from here. You're going to find out what made it great and what didn't. I want to give a huge shout out to Sam Oxier Jr., Ford drag racing legend. He took time to talk with me about the shortcomings of the Boss 429 in both the street application and in drag racing. You see, he drag raced everything from 427 tunnel ports, the 427 SOHCs, and the Boss 429. And with his experience, he was able to tell me why he thought it failed. Ford engineers tried their best to tame this NASCAR race engine well enough to be able to put into the Mustang. They put a 735 CFM Holly on it with a hydraulic cam and small other changes. But people complained about this as the engine was sluggish in performance and was actually slower than the Cobra Jet cars. The first engine was designated as the S code. Then the engineers came out with a mechanical cam and made changes to the rotating assembly to try to lighten it up and that engine is called the T-Code. You would think with those massive Hemi heads that that would be one of its strongest attributes when in fact on the street and on the drag strip it proved to be one of its biggest hindrances. The ports were too large to be able to fill the cylinders with the air charge needed to make good torque. When discussing with Sam about the Boss 429, he informed me about the company politics that was involved in it. You see, Ford was no longer manufacturing the camera. They wanted everyone to go to the latest and greatest, the Boss 429. And what always looks good on paper doesn't mean that it will equal gains at the track. And that's the prime case for this engine. The engine didn't respond to typical modifications like you would think. The rotating assembly was entirely too heavy, it didn't respond to induction changes or cam changes, and that's because the cylinder heads were designed to run wide open on super speedways. Many racers just gave up and went back to the camera because they knew that it worked. It wasn't for a few years that racers figured out how to make this engine run. Ohio George Montgomery had huge success with the camera in the Mr. Gas Gasser. With the 427 camera with the 671 supercharger, he won the 1969 Nationals at Indy. But when he was forced to run the Boss 429, he decided to go a completely different route, twin turbos. In fact, it was so impressive that NHRA actually outlawed him in 1975 because he won the 73 and 74 Gator Nationals with a Boss 429 turbocharged. Boss development in the mid-1970s kind of took a back seat. This is for the reason of NHRA Pro Stock highly favoring small block combinations and small chassis and NASCAR going from the big blocks to the small blocks in 1975. This created no home for the Boss engine and all of that changed up in 1982 when NHRA mandated a 500 cubic inch rule and that brought the Boss 429 back out into the limelight and it was going to be better than ever. The Boss made its comeback in 1981 when none other than Ronnie Sox driving the Ford Mustang in IHRA Pro Stock won the championship. So that was the first championship that was won with the Boss 429. Going into the 1982 season, 
Bob Glidden was building a Ford EXP car. It was originally meant to run the 351 Cleveland-based engine, but when the rules changes come out, he found out that he was going to have to build a 500 cubic inch engine from scratch and put it in this car, which created all kinds of handling problems. Having 500 cubic inches underneath these cylinder heads made a huge difference, and with Bob and Edna Glidden's tuning, they took this thing to the next level. When the T-Bird chassis came out, they won every championship from 1985 until 1989. If that's not something to be proud of, I don't know what is. While the Boss 429 may have had a misunderstanding in its history, it is also arguably one of the best looking engines of all time. And history has been really kind to this engine, and is it now a Ford legend? So I hope you like this video, and until next time, this is Andy from Unity Motorsports, catch you later.